So let's talk about why fixing the low back is a full body process. So that end goal of a back extension, let's take a Jefferson curl, a full spinal flexion again, looking at the end results of low back training. If you obsessed over just trying to get to that point without realizing how many ingredients play into the low back, you may just run into re-injury and re-injury and re-injury. And I think this is why people sometimes dabble in the low back training and then just decide it's not for them. And they don't realize there's ingredients that come from the ground up below the back, from the shoulders down that affect it. So let's go into what this video is gonna cover quick. I've been using a, a format because I'm a ranter. I say it every video, but quick, why fixing the low back is a whole body process. One, the low back works in tandem with so much in the body. It's the fulcrum and center point of a lot of the power in the body. There's a lot of potential go wrong. So we have to work with our body, not against it. Two, access to direct back training. I'm gonna break down in depth how, say you try to do one of the moves I just did, but you have extremely tight or problematic hips, it doesn't reward you the same way. So three, what to do if this is you, and it likely will be, it was for me. And then four, my hope, as always, because I care. Okay, so I wanna share the story of when I was stuck in my re-injury loop in 2019, to 2021, those two years, I kept, after my disc injury, letting it heal, doing the initial bracing stuff for my core, the big three, and trying to stabilize my pelvis and hips. And then I will get back to leg day, and I would try to just deadlift, or maybe do hang cleans or squat, and I kept getting SI joint pain in movements that were nothing like the ins insane, intense low back movements I was just showing. So I had issues that actually had more to do with my hips than my back. And that would explain years before, as a college runner, why I started having back pain even going on jogs and not understanding the anatomy of this all. So first, I had the disc herniation, I had years of re-injury. Every time I'd squat, I started having SI joint pain and I realized my hips started to shift. I've shared this many times in depth of videos. But what happened after is then when I would squat, I started having hip impingement, pinching right inside the front of my hip. I assumed I just had to keep stretching and stretching and it was a muscular problem, but really, my anatomy was getting so bad in the hips that I was having hip impingement, ball and socket, grinding. And so, after about a year of that, I was doing an ab exercise of a dead bug, further trying to stabilize my core for my back. And on something as simple as this, my hip went pop, and I instantly felt the most insane ripple of nerve pain through my whole groin and I gave myself a sports hernia doing something not impressive and so that bad luck that string of why me of my back her my disc herniation then onto the uneven hips to hip impingement and then a sports hernia seemed completely random and I didn't realize until I became a coach now in the past two years connecting with people online that more people have this than not. Maybe not a sports hernia, but more people have secondary dysfunction below their back or above than no issue anywhere in their body and they just have back pain. And so once I realized that, like majority of people that have sports hernia surgeries also were found to have hip impingement in the operation. They were in there, they're operating, and the doctor literally, through studies, they were observing how many of them also had some impingement signs. Majority of them presented with that. Well, it seems like in my mini anecdote study, doesn't count for much on my BBB program, a few hundred people for low back. I've done polls and asked, how many of you guys have hip issues? Whether it feels impinged, restricted, pain, uneven, how many of you guys have direct hip issues? Majority. So majority of the people who are chronic low back sufferers that I've worked with have serious long-term hip issues. I don't know chicken or egg or what caused what. So that's long story short, it is a direct factor I've seen with people and in, including myself. So now 
on my journey of healing, it also played the same role. I also want to talk about why it works in tandem, understanding what the psoas does. So knowing that there's a muscle, your deepest hip flexor that runs from the femur, we'll show a picture of it, to the front of your spine. So every time I was trying to run and finish that swinging through that leg, it would stretch out the hip flexor, but also pull on the spine. Normally that's fine, but when you're super, super tight and you can't do something, say like a split squat flat ground or anywhere close, that's extra pressure that your hip flexor is not lengthened for and it goes extra up to the spine. So that's a factor too. Let's take the QLs. This is a muscle that directly goes from your hip bone to your iliac crest to the lateral side of your spine. So you have muscles that literally attach your hips to your spine. So imagine if your hips are off and then you're trying to balance out your spine and left to right, forward, back, it's not gonna work until you dress the hips. So let's go into upper back. And I know I'm going all over with these little anecdotes and they're not backed and it's not science, but for me, I try to consolidate in these videos every clue that I wish someone presented to me. And you could interpret it in your own, believe it or not. I'm not here to convince you, but I do wish I knew other people had similarities because I feel like it's just me. So. I have gone into studies that have researched in occupations like dentists and people that spend hours in this really awkward upper back position, this kyphosis, this rounded upper back. And this study in particular looked at dentists and saw the majority of them reported to have back pain. And at least half of them had low back pain. So from having hours and hours and hours of an upper back bias here in really bad posture, they found a lot of pain in their low back. Again, you'll see stuff in the internet that says pelvic tilt has no influence on low back pain. That's an old misnomer. We threw that out. That's nothing. It's, but if you speak to more and more people with back pain, relieving pelvic tilt seems to help. The same. People will say there's no such thing as bad posture. This is BS. You shouldn't try to work on your postural setting. But time again, the better that somebody can extend their spine and get their arms up and not feel stuck in their own shoulders and scapula, when people improve this stuff, they report feeling better. This is just me speaking from being on the ground level with people in pain, not in the studies. So just again, what I wish I knew, I'm sharing it. So let's go into why it gives you access for direct low back training. If we go back to something like a back extension, I have full video breakdowns on this already. You need to start with holds and build up reps. And uh, you've probably heard it from me before if you've seen other videos. But if we're trying to maximally strengthen our extension in the glutes and even the spine a bit, if we want to be able to fully extend on this side of the body, the posterior side, we need to be able to fully open up on the front side. Every bit that this front of the hip, the hip flexor, psoas, quads are tight, you are going to be restricted to fully locking out your glutes. And when your hip extension isn't true, but you try to jump, sprint, and lift heavy on it, you trying to sprint on a hip that can't really extend puts pressure on the hamstring. Same with hitting sports. I did a whole rotation video on it. I know I'm referencing stuff all over. But we want to try to train the low back directly. So until we can get to, let's say, a full split squat, not even flat ground, just super straight back leg. Squeeze the quad, squeeze the glute. I've shown this a number of times. If we can get this more opened up on the front, that'll give us access for the back of the hip. But wait, what happens when most people try this? Even here at this level, this is after me working on it for years. Even on a cold day for me, if I jump in, I might feel achiness in my knee or I might feel my ankles are stiff. So if you haven't trained this movement, here's the reality for most people. I'll say this is the number one exercise to fix your low back. Dude, I can't do that exercise. <laughs> My knees are cooked, or my ankles are stiff. And so, let's go further. So back to my first point, why is fixing the low back a full body process? Well, if we want to get to something like a split squat, which is going to open up the psoas, which will give us relief from the pulling on the front of the spine, you have to have mobility in the hip flexor, obviously, that's what we're working, but knee ability, you have to have an opened up ankle. And so, something as seemingly unrelated is a tib raise, being able to close the distance from your toes to your shin. The closer you can get that, 
through strength and then opening up the back side, say a KOT calf raise, stretching out the calves here, that closed distance is going to give you a better shot at a split squat at any height and it be pain free. And so this is just more for the concept. We'll go into what to do about it. Third, so back to this point of gaining more access for training the direct back. Let's take that upper back syndrome I was talking about, how the posture of the upper back can affect how the low back sits. Your overall spinal curvature can be affected. A great movement for that could be something like a pullover. So that's great. If we can have our arms relatively straight, slightly drop the hips at the end, this is putting a massive stretch all through my pecs, through the lats, and letting me go into some thoracic extension. It feels really, really good now, but it used to not. And where it bothered me might be surprising. So if I said, do this exercise to open up your upper back, it's the best thing to give you better posture. Half the people who try it will go into it and be like, oh, my shoulder's about to rip out. And so again, starting at the shoulder to fix low back pain, you would never expect that to be relevant. But real time through being a trainer, I saw this exact phenomenon. I would take people who complained of that, have them do one set to tap out of external rotation. So get blood flow right in some of the musculature that holds the shoulder together. Makes it feel way safer to go into that crazy stretch at the top. And then going through say 15 reps at a solid weight, they immediately would go back to the pullover that they couldn't do. And then they go in, no pain, feels way safe from the shoulder, and then they can start training the posture. So it seems like there's a certain rite of passage at the joint below that lets you train the next joint. If I wanted to work on my knees and really train the knee ability, well, my ankles have to open up to let me do that. The same way if I really want to train my back fully, well, my hamstrings better open up. If I want to get into full spinal flexion, how could I do that if I can't even get my hands past my knees? Sciatica is a whole other topic that we'll make a video on that is a curveball with this. But then even more, if I want to fully extend my hips, the back extension, I really have to open up the hip flexors. So super thorough. I'm talking about so many different examples. I could have structured this more organized, but the point is there's so many things that can go wrong that can not only mess up your back, but mess up your back training to fix your back. So if it's potent to mess a lot of things up, there's a lot of potential to resolve a lot of things, and I think it's optimistic. So this ground up flow and then this shoulder down approach really meets very well to the low back. And we've already done full videos on this, so I'll just reference some with here on this clip. You can train the low back directly with a 360 approach. So starting to work your spinal flexion very gradually, building the back extension. Then after that's mastered, getting to the lateral extension with the QLs going standing, and then eventually up the back extension very gradually, and then training even some of the front of the core with the gar hammer raise, hip flexor, L-sit, all this stuff is super important to take a 360 approach to the back. But most people try to fix their back only with that, and they're missing what I was talking about before. Something that should work for you won't because we're not perfect humans. We have deviations that seem unrelated, that seem random. Just like my hip impingement seemed like bad luck until I realized it was in direct tandem with my back. And so, yeah, obviously there's mobility components. I have a whole mobility video out on this and you, you know that's gonna give you the best bet to get into the range of these exercises. But seeing whatever's going on in your body, aside from the low back pain, really be creative and critical on this thinking and try to piece together like maybe it's not bad luck, maybe it's not random. And through working on your body as a whole, you're putting the favor in your side with this back pain. 
So this kind of is just my hope section where I talk about my first breakthrough with fixing my back being giving up. I literally reached a point with my low back. I kept trying to do trap bar deadlifts. I kept trying to do all these squat variations and keep my legs strong. And my back just kept getting snapped up the next day. I just gave up. And I decided, well, I kept having shin splints and knee pain. I might as well try knees over toes guy zero program. So spending that time opening up all the tight links from the ground up and then strengthening the weak links on the ground up, this was the first time that I even became aware of what was going on from my body from the hips down and improved it a lot. To my surprise, this was the first breakthrough for my back. So getting to a flat ground split squat then, I could show old videos, it wasn't pretty, but that was the first time I felt a day where I could sit and not feel aching in my low back. And I hadn't done any back rehab. So I was like, what's going on? And that's what introduced me to this path of it's all connected, not in some voodoo uh, way, like no, literally the anatomy connects. Your psoas goes from your thigh to your back, your spine. I didn't realize that. And so that led me further with the QLs and just piecing together the hips and all that. But what I'm trying to say is it may not be as hopeless as you think. And it's honestly more optimistic when you don't just have pure isolated back pain and a perfect body. If you have some history of a hip issue or some sort of imbalance that you know about, that gives you a trail of clues to work on which really may help your back. And so I hope this takes the idea of quick fixes for you if you see it online. Try this one exercise to fix all of your back pain and you immediately blah, 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 that whole sales pitch. I hope you could just take that and not be so you know, drawn and discouraged when it doesn't work and play the long game. And then and also just like understand none of this is a guarantee. However, you're giving yourself measurably the best chance. If you could imagine having a shattered leg, your tibia broken, straight hairline fracture, my leg is done, right? What are the percentage odds that you're gonna have pain? 101%, you are going to definitely have pain. Now, what if you were like me and you had stress fractures? You had micro fractures along your tibia. What percentage would you have pain? For me, it was like 60%. How much did I walk today? Was I on my feet or not? Now, what if you just have shin splints? What's the percentage of you experiencing pain in the leg? And what if you just have a scratch? Oh, what's the percentage chance of you having an injury? I may sound like a silly, a stupid, example, but really think about it with the back. So if you have a whole lot of dysfunction and imbalance and all these things you know about your body that are jacked up, the percentage chance of you experiencing back pain is way higher. And so even if you improve this stuff, get way more mobility, feel way better in your joints, balance left to right, front to back, everywhere, hips, upper back, you could still have back pain. And the odds of that are just much lower. And then even after you reach standards of your direct low back training, get your back extension stronger, regain spinal flexion, you could still have back pain. The percentage is just way lower now. And then even after six months, a year of you having perfect structural balance, improved direct low back ability, and improved everything you can on recovery aspects, you could still have back pain. We're just looking at a very, very, very tiny, minute thing a super small percent chance. And honestly, that is the percent chance of people that may need further help and intervention. I'm going out of scope right now, I'm gonna get sued. If there were a case for surgeries or crazy interventions, that would be where it would be more useful. The problem is the whole 80 top percentile that really could work their way down to having less pain, they get thrown into that box way too early. People feel helpless because they don't have the knowledge. I didn't either. The fact that I was actually contemplating a microdisectomy is insane to me because my whole body was jacked up. Of course I had back pain, but no one spoke to me like that. I went to the doctor and it was, oh yeah, you're young, so you're probably just working too hard. You're probably just training too hard. So you need to stop. <laughs> and so there wasn't a, a, any sort of, my doctor didn't lift also. Like, like I didn't have someone that fixed their own body that could tell me through experience like, as a human who also had pain, this is what I had to do to get out of it, and it's not that easy, and regardless, 
I'm not demonizing doctors, it's just the reality my experience was. I didn't have a, a model to go after for the low back. So the point of this whole rant was basically to remind you that the cards are in your favor. And if they're not yet, you can move them in your favor. You could flip the whole game and then play with the house's money. You could literally make your body so balanced, so strong that it's unfair. And the odds of having non-specific, non-operable back pain are going to diminish. It's going to be very unlikely. Really appreciate you watching this video. I know I'm talked on a lot of things, but I literally just make this video for the person that I know will binge all of it because they are stuck. They are literally stuck. They need some guidance. They need some real life, not expert shit about this perfect one thing will fix your whole body and it doesn't and then you're just back to feeling hopeless and you're too young for that and you're like all of it so I'm gonna get better at the YouTube I uh, went through hell to get <coughs> these lights don't ask how much they were I'm shocked at lighting how much that costs recession is real deal because um, y'all were roasting me in the comment section about this terrible light job so I did this for y'all so Appreciate y'all. I'm going to stop right here. That was a lot for one video. I'm going to see y'all in a couple days. Peace.